deep conversations with Uli Bear on big ideas and great books. Should a university professor say anything he or she wants? What if someone says something outrageous on his Twitter feed, on her Twitter feed, or in some other context, but it doesn't impact, presumably, the way they do their job, which is research and teaching? I spoke with Hank Reichmann, who was the vice president and the chair of academic freedom at the American Association of University Professors. It's an organization that's over 100 years old and was originally founded by John Dewey and Arthur Lovejoy in 1915. It defends academic freedom, and Professor Reichmann explained to me the difference between academic freedom and freedom of speech, when and how professors could become liable for what they say outside of the classroom, and how to resolve the cases that make headlines every day. I'm really happy to have uh, Professor Henry Reichman today on the podcast. First of all, Professor Reichman, Hank, thank you so much for joining me today on Think About It. Oh, well, thanks for having me. You have um, a pretty exciting role, and I want to mention two things. You're a history professor, um, and you've just published a book, which I want to refer to a bit later, The Future of Academic Freedom. And you chair a committee on academic freedom and tenure, and you're the, or the, and you're the chair of uh, a foundation by the American Association of University Professors. So could you, it's a pretty exciting time to be responsible for looking at <laughs> academic freedom and tenure, and because the university is the great stage for lots of our public debates in this country. Could you tell me a little bit what the AAUP, this organization, is and what the role of this organization has been for the last hundred years or so? Sure. Well, the, the AAUP was founded in 1915. Its first president was John Dewey, the famous philosopher. Uh, and one, it wasn't initially founded only to defend academic freedom, rather to defend the professional rights of university faculty. Uh, but very quickly, it took on the role of dealing with academic freedom cases uh, in the very first year, they did their first investigation uh, of a violation of academic freedom, which became a, um, a tradition, shall we say. And, and in fact, ever since 1915, every year the AUP uh, does formal investigations. We send a group of uh, usually two or three neutral faculty members to the institution uh, investigate violations of academic freedom. And starting in the late 1930s, those investigations often result in, in administrations being placed in our list of censured administrations. And sometimes they stay on there for quite a long time. Sometimes they get off very quickly. In the 1970s, the AUP adopted collective bargaining as another strategy to support academic freedom and professional rights. And today, about three-fourths of our members are in AUP uh, collective bargaining chapters. The rest are what we've called advocacy chapters, but we're coming to like to think of all these chapters as kind of like they're in a union, uh, although some people don't have the right to organize. The academic freedom work is centered around the committee that I chair. Uh, it was formed in, in the early years of AUP for some reason, which is lost in the you know sands of time or something. That they they gave each of the committees letters, and this was called Committee A. Doesn't stand for academic freedom. Was just the first committee founded. Yeah. For some reason, the committee on governance is called Committee T. Don't ask me why. And, and the Committee A thing stuck. So it's Committee A on academic freedom and tenure and. It meets twice a year in person uh, to discuss policy issues in academic freedom. And also, we're the ones who uh, approve um, reports from those investigations. The, the investigation is authorized by our staff. And the committee has, over the years, issued large numbers of documents, reports, and statements. We also have a full-time staff devoted solely to academic freedom and governance. Uh, and they're the ones who, try, who are... Uh, charged with enforcing the policies that the committee uh, develops. I want to ask something about the role of the organization. So there are about 4,000 universities and colleges, let's, let's say in America, maybe roughly that number. What's the, um, you're not a public or a government organization. You're kind of a voluntary organization. So when people listening can think of it in relation, is it like the ACLU or like another organization that takes up issues that are really of general concern and 
helps universities do the right thing. No, we have no legal powers at all, except uh, insofar as at those campuses, and there's only a, a, about, uh, they're less than 100, uh, where we have collective bargaining agreements. The agreement, of course, is enforceable as a contract, but for the profession as a whole, our, our, our power is mostly moral. Uh, and in fact, in many of these cases where there's violations of academic freedom, our staff will write a letter to the administration pointing out how their policies and their actions are violating our standards, which we see as professional norms. Uh, and uh, they'll write back and say, well, we don't have to listen to you. you. You have no authority over us. And we just simply say, that's true, except we have the authority to shame you if need be. Right. And to right. point out that our standards have been, you know, the 1940 Statement on Academic Freedom and Tenure, jointly issued by the AUP and the Association of American Colleges, has now been endorsed by almost 300 professional uh, and disciplinary associations. Right. So, so it's a moral role. And um, as you said, you meet twice a year and you get a lot of pretty spectacular cases in front of you, cases that make national news that go far beyond a particular college campus or university campus because they touch on the principles. And in your work, you have to probably continually explain and define what is academic freedom, what is freedom of speech, and how do you ensure these values? And I, I really... Oh, love yeah. I liked in your book that Go you ahead. sort of you took these issues and you kind of teased them apart a bit and said there's academic freedom, which is worth defending, and this is your task. And then there's freedom of speech, which is a, a separate value related but distinct from it. Can you say a little bit about how the work on the committee actually, you get a case and then you, you're you trying to apply standards that have been in operation for quite a long time, right? And they've probably been updated a bit over the decades. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, in some ways, I mean, we function bizarrely in a sense, kind of like the the way the U.S. courts, including the, the Supreme Court does. We, we go back to our basic principles uh, by analogy to the Constitution, Bill of Rights, etc. Uh, but we need to interpret them for our time. I mean, obviously, in 1940, when the AUP and a AAC drafted that statement, or even in 1970 when they updated it with a bunch of interpretive comments, there was no social media. There was no internet. Uh, and so, for example, what does it mean? What is uh, academic freedom and freedom of speech? What do they mean on the internet? Um, so we're constantly, so in, in our investigative reports, which can be very detailed and, and sometimes quite long, uh, the average one is about a dozen, 15 pages, but some have some have gone on to like 30 or 40 pages, depending upon the case. They're like a body of case law of like court decisions, et cetera, that we, uh, we fall back on and learn from and are constantly using to develop our ideas. And in the, the, the cases that you've dealt with involve um, several different players, let's say, faculty members who've had consequences for their speech in different contexts, or universities that regulate speech in ways that a lot of people find highly problematic with speech codes or speech zones, et cetera, or students protesting. So you look at all of these moving parts, right, all these different groups. Right, we do, although our investigations are solely about academic freedom. I mm -hmm. mean, we, In fact, the last time the AUP investigated a case in which the rights of students were being violated was in the late 1920s. Uh, and they basically came to the conclusion that this was awful, what was done to the students, and a good university shouldn't do this, but it's not our purview to investigate such cases. And so we don't do investigations, but we've clearly, we've made clear, and it's now been uh, over half a century since we and several other organizations issued a joint statement on the rights and freedoms of students right. that, you know, and as I argue in my book, uh, that it's hard to defend academic freedom and not at the same time defend the freedom of speech of students and others on the campus, and vice versa. An institution that uh, uh, doesn't guarantee protect academic freedom is unlikely to protect the freedom of speech of its students, and vice versa. So, you know, we 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 get get our fingers, so to speak, in in all of it. Right. Um, but our real concern as an organization is protecting the academic freedom of faculty members. And you, you do uh, quite some work in the book to, I, to define academic freedom in a, not in a too rigid a way, so it allows people to give, get a sense because every situation will raise slightly different issues. And you take some issues with some people I've had on the podcast, Stanley Fish, who's 
made a bit of a career out of saying that academic freedom is <laughs> is not a legal value in it. And so can you just give me a general sense of how should people who are not in the university think about academic freedom? Why is it so important? What does it really guarantee? Well, I think academic freedom, you know, I used a quote at one place from Louis Menon who said, academic freedom is not not just a perk of the profession. It's at the core of what we, we do. It's the basic you know, it goes to the heart of it. If colleges and universities are about the search for knowledge, through research for new new knowledge, through teaching, uh, the transmission of of knowledge, uh, and the two are of course closely related. Um, and if you understand that you cannot fulfill that mission if faculty members are not free to go where their uh, their training, their ideas, their expertise takes them. Uh, including in new and sometimes iconoclastic or even dangerous directions, then, then you don't really have uh, a, a university. Uh, and so academic freedom is really based upon the, the, the fundamental mission of the universities, which the founders of the AUP were stressed, whether the university was public or private, was about advancing the common good of society uh, through the develop, you know, the search for new knowledge and the transmission of established knowledge. So, uh on that basis, academic freedom essentially, as we have, it has three basic elements. One is freedom of research to determine the subjects of your research, to control the results of the, that research. Uh, freedom to teach your subject, teach your subject, not to teach whatever the heck you want. I mean, if you're in a class that's you know supposed to be out one subject, you can't teach something else. Uh, and and then third, and this has always been the most controversial, the freedom to speak as a citizen, both of the institution and more importantly of the broader society without fear of discipline. Right. And in the cases you've <clears throat> arbitrated or investigated, let's say, because you don't really put anybody in, on trial, you just try to give recommendations to institutions how to treat their faculty members, they largely seem to touch on this last issue, the freedom of to speak as citizens or in what we call extramural context or in their kind of, let's say, when they're not in a classroom and they're not conducting their research, that s s faculty, professors, teachers speak a lot. As you said, they now speak quite visibly or audibly on social media. And then institutions sometimes have a problem with that kind of speech, right? And so this last yeah. part is freedom to speak as a citizen. One would think, well, we don't leave our rights our First Amendment rights at the classroom door, but maybe we do because in the classroom I shouldn't be able to say anything I want. But when I'm on my own, I can say anything I want, even though I'm employed by the university. Right. Well, I think that's that's true. I mean, one of the great ironies is, you know, for example, uh, I defended the, the right even of Milo Yiannopoulos, who I think is just a hard, horrible human being, frankly, uh, to speak at Berkeley. Well, I live right by Berkeley, so it was close to me. Um, and one of the ironies was uh, defending his right to speak, but a professor in the classroom d doesn't have as many rights as he had to speak on the campus. Uh, because in the classroom, you have the obligation to teach your subject, uh, to advance your discipline, uh, to not you know, uh, make judgments about students that were based upon their politics, their race, their anything like that, other than their achievements in the classroom. Uh, and so, for example, one of the ironies here is uh, – an engineer, uh, for example, Arthur Butts, for years taught engineering at Northwestern University. He was a prominent Holocaust denier. Uh, and we would defend his academic freedom, uh, as, as did Northwestern University, to be a Holocaust denier. It's a horrible position, and university disassociated themselves from it, as long as he didn't bring it up in the classroom. It didn't go to his fitness to teach engineering. Uh, however, had I, as an historian of modern Europe, begun to teach Holocaust denial in my classroom or even to speak about it publicly outside of the classroom. That would go, I think, to my fitness to teach and be a scholar of like modern Europe in the same way that, uh, you know, if I were – I could advocate the, that the – moon is made of green cheese. But if I was an astronomer, I was writing an op-ed that said the moon is made of green cheese, my colleagues would probably, well, they'd probably try to get me help, but you know what I mean. Right. That would be relevant to the, to the position. So, um, but it's really important to defend faculty members' rights to speak as citizens because you could go, an administration could go after somebody 
for a controversial thing they said as a citizen that had nothing to do with their discipline because they didn't like the position they had in their discipline. But it's an interesting thing you point out that there are, you say there are ironies and then we know that people will exploit tensions in the system. So a firebrand such as Milo, you mentioned, they will exploit certain tensions and they will go to Berkeley or a big campus and say, I have to speak here where they can speak in any public park in America if they want to, but they must speak at the university. They know full well that speaking at Berkeley gives them a certain kind of prestige and visibility and they exploit that tension, while Berkeley otherwise, as you said, would not employ anybody to teach a class who has those views because the academic discipline itself wouldn't accept those views according to the standards of what is research and what is right. serious teaching. Right. No, I, I think that's, you know, and a lot of us have ref, wrestled with that. I, I, as you know, I spend a good deal of time in my book trying to wrestle with uh, how that relates to, to the general principles of the uni university and ultimately, I come down to, uh, well, a couple of things. One, there are some universities now that will allow any member of the public, usually public universities, not private ones, uh, to rent a hall and give a speech. I think they do it sometimes to make money, frankly, and it's foolish. It's foolish because, you know, at minimum, you have to have either an organized group on the campus, a student club, et cetera, or a, a university department, et cetera, extend an invitation to a speaker. Now that's been abused. We know that uh, uh, some some of these, somebody like Milo gets a lot of financial support from outside and then uh, they find a, a group, sometimes it's the campus Republicans who just want to stick their finger in people, someone's eye. Um, fortunately, I do think actually some wiser heads are beginning to prevail. I, there's been a number of places where uh, conservative faculty members have, who are advisors to, to, this happened at UCLA, the, uh, young Republicans wanted to invite, I, I can't remember if it was Milo or somebody like that. Uh, and the conservative faculty member says, you have the right to invite them. He says, well, I'm going to stop being your advisor if you do, because this is foolish. There are many, you know, qualified conservative scholars you can invite. And the students actually listened to him and, and did it. So I, I, I think actually that's a, one way we can deal with this is, is faculty members, we need to play a role as teachers, not just in the classroom, but in teaching our students, uh, well, what is a good way to exercise your rights? You know, you have, just because you have the right to do something doesn't mean it's a good idea to do right. it. And as an organization, what I get, I gather from the book and from the work the organization does, you're trying to explain to people in a very clear way what the purpose of academic freedom is. What is research? Why does the pursuit of knowledge in itself have a value? And why do certain things not conform with that or help that? And so what you're trying to say, where the difficult case is when someone is just using the university for other reasons. They want to sell a book. They want to make a buck. They want to be on the news. But they really not in any way have anything to do with what the AAUP does, which is defend the pursuit of knowledge, the advancement of sort of hum common humanity, right? So in some ways, you're in a, put in a position to defend people with whose principles you probably don't really agree because they don't really have that many principles that are academic. I, and well, that, that, that's true. But uh, you know, earlier, you made a comparison between the AUP and the ACLU, one that I thought was at least partially uh, apt. And, and they're also in the same position. We all know that uh, often defend freedom of speech or defend other rights as well. We often have to defend the rights of people who we find repulsive. Uh, and in fact, in some ways, sometimes it's easier to do that because nobody mistakes you for those people. I mean, I don't think anybody thinks the AUP uh, agrees with Milo Yiannopoulos. Um, but, uh, you know, we we defend the rights of people. And, and you know, this comes up in a number of, of places. For instance, the AUP believes uh, that academic boycotts are a violation of academic freedom, including the academic boycott boycott of Israeli universities and Israeli scholars, uh, and and we've we've taken that position and taken a, a bit of heat from some people who would normally be our supporters. At the same time, however, uh, we defend vigorously the right of people to advocate a boycott, uh, and. Uh, some people have said, well, that makes no sense. But to me, it makes perfect sense. It's just like defending the right of somebody to speak without endorsing what they say. Well, give me a little help here. I actually 
I, I want this to make sense, and I want to be able to say, yes, this makes perfect sense. And I think what's happened and what, have I, what I've talked to, a lot, I've talked to a lot of students, students are a little doubtful sometimes and think, my university a bit too often, and this is paraphrasing, caves to the pressure of outside agitators, provocateurs, funded really well, super ultra conservatives who don't have any academic merit, who just come to provoke. And they keep on saying, well, academic freedom, they actually usually say freedom of speech. We must have X, Y, and Z speaker here. And then the students say, I don't really trust that my university is truly committed to other values, let's say diversity and inclusion, because they keep unfolding every single time some firebrand comes and provokes the university and they say, well, we must, we must allow them, although we don't, we don't agree with them. And the tricky thing is, I think, what you point out in the book, is that we live in America right now where, as we see today, every single day, there's lots of polarized debates going on. And what, we, what university presidents and institutions come up against, that their students don't have the faith that more leadership is really there. That, say, from the president down, they say, do I really trust that an organization that defends neo-Nazis and white supremacists doesn't kind of a little bit support them? So I've interviewed David Cole, legal director for the ACLU, and I said, David, you are aware a lot of students don't really believe you should be defending neo-Nazis because they think, why do they get free legal aid from the ACLU when there's so many other problems and white supremacy really targets people who really don't have access to the same defense? So you, the question I'm asking is, when you're saying it's obvious well, we're defending the principle of speech but not the content of that speaker, I think the question in, in our country for a lot of students is, is that really what's being maintained all the time? So you defend the principle to boycott, but not what's being boycotted. Do you see what I, where, I, where I'm trying to sort of unpack this a bit, this, this idea that the moral position is really clear? The, the whole so-called crisis of free speech on campus is, is, is mostly manufactured. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that every day on every American college and university campus, there are all sorts of conversations, discussions in and out of the classroom by all sorts of speakers across the political spectrum and among, of course, most importantly, many things that have nothing to do with politics um, uh, all the time. Once you allow those groups, for example, student organizations, to invite speakers, then the university, particularly a public university, uh, a public university has a legal obligation to, to not uh, apply political criteria. A private university, I would understand, as moral obligation. Again, that said, that does not prevent the university from their exercising their own free speech rights. Uh, and uh, I quote at one point in my book, Frederick Lawrence, who was the uh, uh, ex uh, secretary of the Phi Beta Kappa Society and former president of Brandeis University, um, who said something very important, and I've been on panels with him where he stressed it even more. Uh, he said that the famous line from Justice Brandeis, the remedy for bad speech is more speech. He says, it's not just a principle. He says, it's an obligation. He says, for a university right now, it's a professional obligation where speakers go to the very heart of what the university is supposed to be, to its diversity, diversity of ideas, diversity of student rights, to the mission of the university, that the university doesn't just have the right to respond. They have the obligation. And of course, there's ways you can do that well and ways you can do that poorly. Uh, there are some campuses I know where, where uh, controversial speakers said, yeah, he's here, and whether it's my line, remember who it was, going to speak. And Richard Spencer, I think, was one, the KKK Nazi guy. Um, he, uh, he can speak, but at the same time, we are going to have a program on the other side of campus. We are going to facilitate a picket, a peaceful picket line. We are going to do educational programming, etc. Uh, and it works quite well. And it makes clear that, that the concern that, that is my institution endorsing this is clear. No, they are not. When somebody like a Milo or Ann Coulter, uh, somebody who really, uh, whose message goes to the very heart of what the university is about, that I, th uh, I think the university does have a, a professional, if not a moral obligation to counter that speech. And, uh, and, and the ways to counter it may vary by situation, by the intensity of the, the nature of the speaker, et cetera. 
Um, but um, uh, but I, I do think that uh, that's a really important way to, you know, dealing with that question of this, the, getting the confidence of students at the university is 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 sticking to what its mission really is. In your book, you give a, a bit of a, a broader context to say this is not just that there are speech controversies, but that the university as an institution faces some real challenges, that one of them is the kind of the, um, the s s gradual diminishment of tenure as a, as a condition of employment, then there's funding issues, there's a general um, skepticism toward expertise, and then there's a, a sense that there's a kind of normative way or orthodoxy of thinking in universities. So all these factors are things you address, that there's a, a general climate of universities not enjoying the kind of esteem and popularity that the general public thinks universities are the best places, surprisingly, although lots of students still go to universities. But he's saying there are other factors that also put pressure on universities to maintain this, this, these, I, these conditions. And they're not just speech controversies by some firebrand. No, I, I, I totally agree. And in fact, actually, as I, as I suggested earlier, I, I think these, these, this free speech crisis, you know, is really, it, it's overhyped. I mean, it's just not, if you look at the real challenges most universities are facing, uh, challenges to academic freedom in particular, but also to freedom of speech, I mean, this is, the, this is not the major one. Uh, I think actually the biggest threat to academic freedom now is, has been the casualization of the professoriate. Three quarters of all those who teach in higher education now are off the tenure track completely uh, and hence have minimal, sometimes no, protections for their academic freedom. This is far more concerning to me than, uh, uh, than whether Milo Yiannopoulos uh, can speak on campus. Uh, similarly, I think... Uh, you know, you, you mentioned the notion that expertise is under uh, under assault, and and the whole sense of is there a, some some thing as expert knowledge? I think this is this is terribly important. In fact, right now, uh, our committee is working on a statement that I hope we will be able to release before the end of the year, uh, under the title "In Defense of Knowledge," uh, and uh, it's still in still being worked on. In fact, it isn't even in draft yet, but uh, it's something that we have a subcommittee uh, working on. I've just been at corresponding, in fact, the last several days about this. And I'm hoping it's something we can get other organizations to sign on to as well, uh, because I think that this is terribly important right now, this assault on the notion of, uh, of, of expert knowledge, of the search for knowledge, of, uh, and ultimately of the freedom to, to go where intellect takes you. But it's quite interesting. I actually, when you said there's a, that three quarters of the professors are no longer tenured, um, there are people in the public who would say, well, why would you tenure people? You know, you should be able to, you know, evaluate them all the time, and it's very unusual for a profession to have lifetime employment. And one would think that the great advocates for free speech, which is a, a great many conservative commentators, would be full-throated defenders of tenure. But they're not. Actually, what's quite interesting is that the the very conservative kind of criticism of the university is that the university is too liberal. There are too many what used to be called tenured radicals or liberal professors. And in a strange way, so the AAUP has to fight on different fronts and the alliances are not always clear that you're trying to say tenure is an inherent value to the university and protects the university's mission to seek the truth and protect knowledge. One would think that is something that everybody can get behind. So if you're looking at it from a bit from a longer perspective in your book, why has it happened that tenure has been diminished or sort of slowly dismantled over the last 30, 40 years? Why is this trend going to, you know, to as you say, casualize labor and universities? And now we're in a situation where universities are defending themselves constantly against all these charges. Well, I, I think there are several factors. One is, is, is simply economic. I mean, the casualization of the professoriate uh, is, is, can't be uh, disconnected from the casualization of the labor force in general. Just reading in the paper today, you know, the majority of Google employees are just on short-term you know, contracts. They have no job security, not, nothing at all. Uh, and so they're afraid even to, you know, to 
be out because they they want to get a permanent job. You know, well, this is very very common, and and a lot of it has to do with the the assault on the funding of universities, particularly public universities. But it also there's been a sort of erosion of battering away at the notion of what tenure is about, and and it's important to recognize tenure is not about guaranteed lifetime employment no matter what. People can be detenured. And in fact, I would argue probably should be more often than does happen, as long as it's done with the appropriate due process. Uh, It isn't just a a, a guarantee for a a lifetime sinecure. The AUP has always said that uh, tenure means uh, a continuing appointment that could be terminated only for cause, well, for cause and financial exigence, yeah, but let's spend a moment for cause. We've never defined what cause is. There are some things that are obvious. Um, criminal behavior, uh, embezzlement from the university, uh, research fraud, plagiarism, um, I would argue also sexual harassment. There are a lot of other things that could be, uh, you know, that could be reasons for for detenuring somebody. So it's important to recognize that the, the, while we would love, I, I think most jobs should have protection that they can't be fired just for things they say in their own private lives. I mean, you know, but in the real world, that's a goal, not likely to happen much. But there's a particular reason for professors because. Without academic freedom, without a protection for academic freedom, we can't do our jobs. Right, right. At least do them correctly. Right. Can I ask you a specific question? I've been asked this quite a lot. Um, is there anything you said that the freedom to speak as a citizen should not be touched? And then at the same time, you say conducting research and teaching in a classroom that adheres to some rules and regulations by the profession. For example, if I teach a class on uh, Philosophy, I cannot introduce things from, I don't know, baseball or that's the example that Robert Post usually gives or from engineering, which I know nothing about because my obligation is to teach the subject. So there are certain limits on things. Do you think there is there anything else that people could introduce? You said earlier the example of a Northwestern engineering professor who was a prominent Holocaust denier who presumably used his status and title of the university also to promote this um, vile point of view, and the university you said should stay out of this. It just doesn't, as long as it doesn't enter his classroom, there's no problem. But the cases you looked at, and the cases you look at in your committee, they're trickier. They are where people say someone is in the classroom, and their extramural statements on Twitter, etc., possibly influence the way they're also behaving in the classroom or treating students. Which so. It's your work in the committee to sort of look at these and, and look really carefully of what happens in those situations. Well, it, it is tricky. I mean, and extramural speech, I mean, our position is it, it should be relevant to discipline only if it goes directly to fitness for the position. Okay. What does it mean to be fit for the position? Well, th- these are, can be tricky. For example, in the book, I talk about the case of Joy Correga, who uh, posted on Facebook some virulently anti Semitic things. Um, And uh, she was hired to teach social justice writing. Well, if you're teaching social justice writing and you're a bigot, (laughs) you know, that could go to fitness for the position. Uh, Now, did it? Well, it's not for the AUP to judge, but a, a duly constituted faculty committee constituted in essential agreement with the recommended standards of the AUP, voted by a plurality that it did, and she was dismissed. And we did not defend her after that. We provi- Up to that point, by the way, our staff had provided advice to her. But once that process was done, we didn't. Whereas Stephen Salida, who also made what were alleged to be anti-Semitic comments, although I would argue they were far less objectionable than hers, but let's assume even for the moment they were, never got any due, due, due process at the University of Illinois. And we defended it right away. Uh, and he, in fact, was in a tenured position and should have gotten even more consideration than, than Correga, who was not yet tenured. So, so these things matter. And the current interesting case, to my mind, on this is the case of Amy Wax, uh, who is this uh, conservative law professor at the University of Pennsylvania, tenured, uh, who has in recent years moved from being a sort of 
garden variety conservative law professor to somebody who is in many respects a white supremacist and making all sorts of terrible comments, including comments about minority students at Penn. In, in, the, uh, law, in the law school. So she made comments in public yeah. about students who she claimed had enrolled in her classes and didn't perform. Yeah, and she as, said she, ne she said she never had a black student who, who performed well or something like that. I mean, it was specific. To, and it was, it was frankly, it was also not really big. It was false. It was a complete false statement about not only her students, but about, about students at Penn in general. Uh, and the administration at Penn decided at that point to remove her from teaching required classes. Um, and that could be construed as a disciplinary measure for which she should have been entitled to due process. Uh, but it can also be construed, and, and personally, I'm not speaking for the AUP here, I'm speaking for myself, I think it was not inappropriate at all. Uh, I think it goes to her fitness to teach a class. If people in that class have a reasonable expectation that she is not going to be fair to them. Uh, and she's given them that reasonable expectation. And it, not, it wasn't just by general abstract comments about race, which might also be problematic, but it was specific comments about Penn students. So uh, I, I think that that's another case. But I mean, these things are always evolving. We have to look at each case. Um, but it, another one. The, but, this yeah, case, let's stay with this case for 10 for a moment. It's quite interesting because it touches on something that ignites a lot of these speech controversies, which I would hazard a guess that the vast majority of speech controversies are about race on campus. They are not about um, whether to teach Plato or Milton. They're actually about race. And we look at the controversies, there are in some ways statements which are discussed as offensive or controversial. And from another side, a lot of people would say, no, they're not controversial, they're actually racist. They're actually not offensive. They actually go against the equality mandates of the university. And I'm quite of interested in this case, um, which is not for us to decide on here, but to say it brings up attention in the university that the students, uh, rightly, both white and black students, are saying, I can't expect this professor to treat us according to the same standards if she says some of us are not capable, inherently, because of our race, of doing intellectual work. So in some ways, what you said earlier, it goes to the heart of the university's mission to say you've enrolled, you've applied, you've been admitted to the class, and we assume that you will be treated equally according to what you achieve in this class. And this professor is saying, I don't well, So this is, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, first of all, let me say, I, I, I'm not so sure I agree that, that all these controversies are mainly about race. There have been a lot of controversies about gender, about sexual orientation in particular, uh, LGBTQ rights, et cetera, that. But that said, and also, by the way, I, don't, I think particularly with academic freedom cases, a lot of them are about, uh, they're about also the right of faculty members to speak out about the university's policies. But I, I think we have to make a distinction, and, and it's not always an easy line to draw. And that's what makes our work so fascinating. We can, we'll have at our committee meetings long debates about this. Uh, but make a, a line draw between um, your one's viewpoints and ideas and one's actions. Uh, Amy Wax, one could argue, has every right to advance racist ideas. She doesn't have the right to apply them in the classroom. Now, where does the, the, the line can be drawn? And, uh, and I think I, I do not envy the dean of the law school at the University of Pennsylvania or, or her colleagues who, who, who need to draw that line um, because it's not always easy to find. But I think that is the basic principle. Uh, and, and I think people can be one to see that as well. Um, but the other thing to point out is that, you know, there are the majority of conservative faculty members in the United States are not like Amy Wax. <laughs> they are uh, they are people who, whose views I may not agree with, you may not agree with, but who hold them sincerely uh, and who are not racist. Even if some people may think that the, the, the that the policy choices they advocate would assist racism, etc., that's very different. And so I I think it's very important to to, to make that distinction. And um, uh, and one of the things, you know, it, it just to go back to something we mentioned earlier. You were pointing out that how so many conservatives you would think would support. 
tenure, but have gone, gone after it, you know, because of all the tenured radicals and all that kind of stuff. The interesting thing is conservative faculty members don't have that attitude. Uh, in fact, they think that tenure protects them because they are in departments where most people are liberals or even leftists, uh, and tenure protects their ability to dissent from what the orthodoxy is among their colleagues. So... Uh, what you just described is quite interesting when you said you look at in your committee, does someone's political view affect their fitness as a teacher? And you say as long as they can be reasonably expected to treat students fairly and their colleagues fairly, then their political views are kind of off the table. That We can test that to a point. Of course, there's always some gray area. But what's interesting is that there's another huge debate that you discuss in your book, that there's this pervasive sense in mainstream media from self-identified liberals and conservatives that academia is too liberal, that conservatives can't speak, that the true victims of these free speech witch hunts are conservative students who are terrified of, of, of offering an opinion, that conservative faculty members feel completely um, silenced. And it's quite interesting that the free speech debate makes them into the targets or victims of free speech. Well, I think I think in certain departments, in some places, that may be true. But by and large, I think it's uh, at minimum grossly exaggerated, if not basically a lot of it hogwash. I, I think that there are uh, significant numbers of conservative faculty members on campus. But moreover, even in those disciplines where conservatives don't find themselves – it's it's not necessarily because of any censorship. Uh, moreover, if English departments uh, and gender studies departments don't have many conservatives, well, how many uh, advocates of trade unions are there in business schools? Not very many. Economics departments have a tendency to be very conservative. Indeed, uh, back in the 1970s, there was a brief moment where every economics department felt it had to have a Marxist ec economist, but that's long past. So uh, I think, you know, it, it goes multiple ways. I think in any human arrangement, there is a tendency toward conformity and people want to get along, etc. But I think there, uh, uh, there's certainly ideological diversity on campus. But most important, no one has ever, ever mustered any evidence that liberal faculty members uh, discriminate against students with conservative views. In fact, if there's any evidence, is that sometimes a conservative business faculty uh, discriminate against students with, with liberal views, um, although I think that's also really a minority and not much of it. So I, I think this is much overwrought. And what do you think, since you... You have this role. You work, for, you know, in the, on this on this committee for the AUP, and now writing this book for the public. How do you think one can correct this mis this misperception? Because it's quite powerful, and I have, as you do, a lot of friends who are not in the universities or whose children go to universities, and who say, "Oh, I, I don't even know how you can function there. You must not be able to say anything for two reasons. First of all, because." There's huge political correctness police, and they'll silence you and shame you anything you say. There's no more language available. That's kind of a perception in the public. And then they, f and then they feel, on the other hand, like if you're conservative, you can't say anything because there's too many liberals. So it's, it's so. How do you shift this narrative to actually reflect what happens at universities in this country? Well, I think the best we can do is education. It's one of the reasons I wrote my book. It's one of the reasons I wrote some of the the, the book is composed a good part of essays or blog posts, uh, much revised that I had published earlier. Uh, we try. What can I say? Um, I, I do think that uh, you know we deal with a a, a kind of propaganda machine. I mean, and it's not limited to, to uh, conservatives. I, I think. Uh, somebody pointed out, and I, I'll, I won't get the numbers exactly right, but it's something like uh, in about an 18-month period, the New York Times published something like over 20 articles about you know, the censorship of so-called conservatives on campus and one or two about the social media assaults on liberals, uh, minorities, uh, transgender people, which are far more actually frequent than the free speech controversies over conservatives. Can you say something? This is, you know, 
just to get a sense of where we are in our country, and I think it's really an important discussion that universities and the topics you discuss in the book are not marginal to the main discussions about where we are politically in our country. And there, I think there has been a sense that the one thing that Donald Trump has been able to do, he's been able to explode a lot of these pieties and politically correct assumptions. And he has said a lot of things that I think a lot of people felt, well, finally, someone will just say things the way they really are. And he doesn't care at all about any speech police or what you should term, what kind of phrases you use. So there's a kind of liberation that he generates because people can finally say what they want. The flip side of this, he also says things that are really upsetting to lots of people and that now we have a debate in this country whether this is white supremacy or racism, which is a strange debate that people are debating very technical terms as if there's no content to them. But how do you see this larger phenomenon that there's a pervasive sense that universities didn't really produce the diversity of viewpoints that we wanted in this country, and that there was something not acknowledged or not said that people are too um, timid and are just adhering to a kind of speech code? Well, first of all, the purpose of universities is not to produce diversity of opinion. The pur purpose of universities is to advance knowledge. Uh, and uh, I, I think, you know, we do a, a pretty good job of that. Uh, especially given the fact that, as you've suggested, as we talked about, that the political and uh, cultural atmosphere is increasingly hostile uh, to that very mission. Um, but I do think that uh, uh, we need to have free-willing discussions about things, and I think that uh, academic freedom and freedom of speech both are designed to protect that. But I do think, you know, from the vantage point, particularly of academic freedom, faculty members are kind of in a bind. Uh, because we can model uh, all sorts of free speech for our students. We can say whatever's on, like, on our mind. But what we also need to model is scholarship and is the kind of careful thought that should go into a scholar's work, uh, the kind of discipline. So in, in a classroom, uh, it isn't appropriate for a professor to just mouth off and say whatever the hell comes to his or her top of his or her mind. It's got to be well thought through, etc. Uh, and and to model that with behavior, it's difficult then in a classroom discussion if a student wants to speak. Well, the student doesn't have the training the faculty member has. You know, the faculty member is supposed to provide some model, some guidance, uh, but at the same time has to realize that there are other people in the classroom. If the student says something that could offend other students, you have to you have a classroom teaching situation you have to deal with. The remarkable thing is, is that I think uh, most faculty members do a pretty darn good job of that. I mean, no one doesn't make mistakes, and some are better than others, but there are all sorts of conversations going on in classrooms around the United States in which people of very different backgrounds, with very different assumptions, uh, discuss things, and things can get heated, uh, yet they manage to maintain a certain amount of mutual respect, etc. And I think that that's where universities can, uh, can provide a model for the society as a whole. I want to go back to something we said earlier. When you issue a, um, is it called a report, when you're in the AAUP committee and a case comes to your attention, mm -hmm. um, two questions. Do you decide what cases to look into, or do universities come to you and say, could you give us some guidance here on how to, how to resolve this issue? Well, both things happen. I mean, there are, uh, I think especially where there are really good administrations and they're working with their faculty uh, and an issue comes up on campus, maybe they're going through their um, faculty handbook trying to revise it. Uh, they will contact our office and say, can you give us advice you know, on, on what to do? And we will uh, d direct them to some of our documents and sometimes actually provide direct uh, input. Uh, but when a case where there's a violation comes up, it's usually the faculty member who is being, uh, uh, who is in the crosshair, so to speak, who will contact the association. Uh, and uh, we usually try not to intervene unless the faculty member wants us to, although in some cases where it's really highly public, we, we have no choice but to say something. Um, and then our staff will usually write a letter uh, to the administration. We call it a case letter outlining position, hopefully that has some effect. Uh, and it's only in certain cases where that kind of intervention is ineffective and 
the case for one reason or another seems to highlight important concerns for the profession as a whole at the moment uh, that we that the executive director will authorize one of these investigations uh, and, and we will send one of these investigation teams. Um, uh, sometimes a lot of people around us have a um, uh, a a sort of image that we can just investigate. They call something, they say, something happened on our campus, investigate. Right. You know, and we don't just go in. First of all, if we did every case that were every violation, we would quickly run out of our resources. Um, uh, and also it wouldn't have the impact it would have. If there were, if there were 30 investigations a year and 30 institutions put on the central list, we would look impotent. Uh, indeed, we probably would be impotent. But, if, you know, so we choose those carefully. And um, they may not. They may be ones that garnered headlines, like the Stephen Salida case a few years ago in Illinois, Edwards University in Texas. It's a small Catholic school, uh, and Nunez Community College in Louisiana. Uh, these were not headline-grabbing events, but they, they crystallized some real issues. And in both those cases, it was the rights of faculty members to speak out as part of in the, in the shared governance of the institution. Mm-hmm. And in in. Based on your work, and then in the book, you write about the future of academic freedom. But the book, I was trying to get a sense when I was reading it, whether it's, there's a measured sense of um, we can still win this kind of embattled um, principle. We can defend it successfully. Although you say the grave threats are the casualization of labor, the undue influence of money, perhaps that is perhaps greater than it was. And you, you outline a couple other issues, sort of state legislatures and these debates about how to sanction universities for not adhering to how they define certain things, which takes the autonomy of universities away. But, but ultimately, from all the work you've done in the books, where do you think um, universities are going to end up? Because if you listen to some of the news, you waver between shut them all down and give people sort of online training or... <laughs> Or, or leave it to them. And in some ways, universities have been a bit slow, I think, to respond to explain what they really do well. I think there's been a bit of a, a lag where people have thought, well, they should know we do really good work and this is what we do. And I think your book is saying it takes a bit more effort to explain what academic freedom is really meant to defend. It's not just a word. You just assume you know what it means. Okay. Well, I think, you know, at the end of the first chapter, I, which is entitled, Does Academic Freedom Have a Future? And my answer to the question is, it's up to us. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not going to say it does or it doesn't. I, I, I think the one guarantee that it won't have a future is for us to say we lost the battle. But I do agree, obviously, that universities have been slow. Uh, they've been complacent about these values. Uh, and I haven't defended them as vigorously as you can. And one of these, one reason for that has been the impact of what I call the power of money that sort of uh, the, the corporatization, some have called it. Uh, I, I like the term that Gary Rhodes and Sheila Slaughter came up with, academic capitalism, that has resulted in university administrators, particularly at the highest levels in some, some cases, who really aren't scholars at heart. I mean, some of them may be, but they, they look at the university as, a, as if it was a business enterprise rather than as, as an intellectual enterprise. And, uh, and so they've been slow to defend the values of the university. Uh, I, I, I have some optimism that that's changing uh, because, in fact, particularly uh, when faculty members have been attacked for their social media speech, for example, uh, many university administrators immediately say, we don't agree with her, we, 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 and all they're about is, is protecting the university's image so they don't lose donors or something like that. And I think a lot of them have found that that strategy doesn't work anyway, mm-hmm. and that you might as well go straight to the heart and say, this is what the university is about. If you don't like it, don't give us money. You know, And I have some evidence that Joan Scott and I gave a talk at the about social media harassment with the, uh, at the president's meeting at the AACU, which are all college and university presidents there. And several of them stood up and said, you're right. In fact, we tried that and it was terrible. And we we don't rely on your advancement office or your general counsel in these cases. Go to your heart of the, the, the institution. So so I have some, some optimism. It's a cautious optimism. Um, but let's face it, uh, and this is something I mentioned in the book, we are as bad as the situation may appear sometimes in higher ed today. It's not nearly as bad as it was 100 years ago when the AAUP was formed. Uh, there was no tenure there. Tenure was just a perk you gave to a handful of really prestigious professors at really prestigious institutions, and that was it. 
Uh, there was no tenure system. Uh, there was no real sense of academic freedom. Uh, university presidents were typically, well, tyrants would really probably be the best word, <laughs> like Nicholas Murray Butler at Columbia, or people like that, fired faculty at will when they didn't like what they said. So, you know, our our predecessors managed to turn that around. So I, I think we can build on what they did. And obviously, the situation is never, history doesn't repeat itself, certainly not exactly. But I have some optimism that we can do it. But the one thing I know is if we don't try, if people don't Faculty members don't join the AAUP, don't put their money and their time where their hearts are, then we won't win. And can you tell me something concretely? You have about there's about forty thousand members, and what does it entail to join the AAUP if you're a college professor or teacher or affiliated with a university? Well, if, if you're at a campus, which is a very small, relatively small number, the AUP is the union, you may well already be a, me a member right. because most faculty members do join their union. The ones who don't, it's often a matter of principle that we don't particularly agree with anyway. Uh, but at most schools, you can just go online to AUP.org, uh, click the join button uh, and pay dues. Uh, and people think, well, what do I get for my dues? And, and it's like, well, what do you get for paying your dues to the ACLU? What do you get for a lot of things? You get the sense that you are contributing to the profession. You can, of course, do more. You can form a chapter at the AUP at your campus, or if one exists, join it. Uh, some chapters will then uh, uh, have some voluntary local dues so they can do some programming on campus, invite outside speakers. I uh, I, I'm traveling around all around the country this fall. I'm, geez, I'm bouncing around the country like almost every week uh, giving talks about academic freedom, trying to encourage people to form chapters, to join the AUP, um, and of course to buy and read my book. But um, right. yeah. the, uh, uh, but I think those are the things that people can do. Um, but I will say the one thing is that if you're a faculty member whose academic – freedom has been threatened, or you feel it's been threatened. Maybe it hasn't, but you don't understand. You feel, if you contact the AUP, we don't ask, are you a member? Okay. We encourage you to join. We think it, you should join. And, and if you are a member, we, we will make sure to give some, as much consideration as we can. But we pr defend the principles. We don't just defend our members. We defend the principles of academic freedom and the principles of shared governance. Right. I want to ask you one thing about your own experience. You talk about your classmate at Columbia, I believe, who was one of the leaders of the uh, free speech movement there, I guess, in the late 60s. And when you look back... It's, <laughs> I don't call it a free speech movement. <laughs> uh, but what's important to me is I've talked to a, a lot of people who gave me sort of a deep history of the free speech movement at Berkeley, at Columbia, at those schools. When we think about Berkeley, Columbia, and the upheaval on campus in the 60s, my sense was always, but I went to college in the late 80s, that universities became better ultimately because of what happened in the 60s, that ultimately they became better, that actually they gave more access to more people, that brought more people to universities. There was a, an opening of the curriculum. And then a lot of people say today's crisis is as bad as the 60s, and then there's a sense, and in the 60s things got worse. And in some ways, what's your sense of what happened in the 60s? Was that a general opening or did, did it lead to a, a decline of excellence, the end of Western civilization, the kind of Alan Bloom argument, which is a bit more nuanced than I'm making it sound right now, actually. But in t terms of if you're looking at the history of these battles on campus, is the, was the outcome better or worse for universities in the 70s and 80s? Well, I, I think... Um... Let me speak specifically to, uh, with Columbia, where I was a student and where we, you know, we occupied six campus buildings or five campus buildings for six days and we were arrested and we shut down the institution. And it wasn't really over free speech. It was over um, the Vietnam War, ultimately Columbia's role in it and over um, uh, Columbia's attempt to build what was uh, segregated and arguably racist gym on public lands. Uh, we won that. By the way, the, that gym was never built, and Morningside Park is much better for it, as is Columbia. They built a much better gym right on campus. Uh, but more important than that physical thing is I think you're right. I think the student movements of the 60s, uh, combined with a lot of the other movements of the 60s, tended to open up universities more to new ideas. Um, I think there was a greater respect for students. I mean, look, when I came to Columbia in 1965, uh, 
a good friend of mine was uh, suspended from the university for a year when during freshman orientation, he had a girl in his room uh, when out, it wasn't permitted. Uh, I mean, imagine that. Now we have co-ed dorms, you know. Uh, I, I mean, these were the kinds of restrictions that, 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 that we had, and, and they were blown away by the time I graduated. That, that, those regulations were, 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 if not gone, they were going almost everywhere. So I, I think we, we did a lot. Did we make mistakes as students? Of course we did. We were in our early 20s. Uh, who doesn't make mistakes when you're 20, 21 years old? Uh, some of the tactics we used, I look back on now and I go, gee, I wouldn't support them now. But so what? They, we were students. Students learn. And, uh, uh, and and this is what I think is important. I actually wrote about this, in, not in the book, but I have a little essay in a book about uh, of reminiscences of the Columbia strike on its uh, 50th anniversary that Columbia University Press published, uh, in which I said basically this. And it's interesting to me what you say. So when you look at the students today, why do you think there's such a reluctance to think this is the next generation? These kids are going to actually improve our country. And there's a lot of um, invective directed at them, saying they're ruining our universities, they are controlling the way you speak, they are from climate change activists to gun activists to gender activists to LGBT activists to Black Lives Matter. This is the end of America. And it's puzzling to me that this country doesn't embrace this generation and say, this is the future of America. It's not totally well, puzzling. But. Well, I, 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 to me, two things are puzzling. First of all, the kind of students you just described are a minority, hmm. as were we, the radicals in the 1960s, okay. a minority. Okay. Uh, and, you know, they, 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 they're entitled to their activism. I want to encourage their activism because of the impact impact they will have, not just on themselves, including with them, as I said, they'll make mistakes, but uh, on, on others. But I think the one difference in this generation and the others, and it's one that really troubles me, is not the fault of the generation, but is the opportunities open to them, is these are students now who are going to come out of school with, uh, you know, a lifetime's worth of student loan debt. Uh, many, we have students, we didn't have students when I was in, sc in school who were homeless, uh, who were hungry, who were, you know, nutrition challenged. We now have that, and not just at community colleges or at local state universities, but even at some elite schools. I mean, I said I live near Berkeley. Berkeley is, you know, the, the premier public research university in the country, if not the world. Yet we have a significant portion of the student body here who are homeless. Now, partly that has to do with the housing crisis in Berkeley, but uh, numbers who are, who are food challenged. We have food banks for them. That wasn't the case in the 60s. So I, uh, I I have a lot of compassion for students today and, uh, and great admiration for students who, facing these kinds of challenges, uh, are still willing to uh, become active and, in fact, who see their activism as a way of dealing with those challenges. I, I'm, a, I'm a great admirer of today's students. I think they're just terrific. Yeah, I think I agree. I actually think it's – and what you said is interesting. I, I think you're right. It's a small – part of the student body, but it's inspiring for other people. And I think what's important in your book, you also note that you say we should be careful to restrict their rights to speak too quickly when we defend other people's rights to speak so that there's this kind of um, necessary balance in, in consideration of context. Uh, Hank, I want to thank you for this conversation. And um, you said you're going to be traveling and taking this uh, book on the road a little bit. So it's called The Future of Academic Freedom. Uh, it's published by Johns Hopkins University Press. And I really um, want to thank you for grounding it in the actual work you've done on all these really difficult cases. It's, it's so interesting to oh, read. So it's so interesting to read for somebody who's kind of been in the so, so trenches to sort of to really deliberate on these decisions, which are really not easy. No, uh, it's, it's been a great, I mean, I will say, just in conclusion, that I've been doing this Committee A work now for almost a decade, wow. uh, and it's been the most fulfilling, most exciting, most interesting part of my career, certainly, perhaps even of my life. Really? Um, and uh, I really, I, I've enjoyed it immensely, and I've met so many really dedicated, wonderful people uh, among the faculty, among students around the country. And I really, uh, uh, it, it's, been a, it's been a privilege and an honor. Thank you so much. And um, 
I wish you best of luck with um, getting it out there and probably will cross paths at some point. I hope so. One of those campus visits. Thank you.